Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Asian Hustle Network podcast. Today, we have a very special guest with us. His name is Moni Na. Moni, a survival of the killing fields of Cambodia, immigrated to the U.S. with his family at the age of six. He became a police officer and served in Livermore for 17 years before retiring from law enforcement to establish his own real estate business 14 years ago. He is the co-founder of Tri-Valley Nonprofit Alliance, focused on supporting local nonprofits by collaborating and sharing resources to continue growing their mission. Moni also became a children's book author, Officer MNOP, and me, How Police Officers Serve the Community on and Off Duty. A former mayoral candidate in the city of Livermore and now known as the Giving Back Realtor, Moni has been featured in CBS Early Show, ABC Extreme Makeover Home Edition, and he has been awarded the Good Neighbors Award from Bay East Association of Realtors and National Association of Realtors. In 2018, Moni received the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Legacy Award and the St. Mary's College Meritorious Service Awards in 2019. Moni, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, you guys. It's uh, really, truly an honor to meet both of you and uh, to see you. Uh, like, I can see your face and smile. This is great. <laughs> so thank you so much for having me. It's an honor. Of course. I mean, it's absolutely an honor to have you on this podcast as well. And for you guys that don't know, Moni is also inside our Asian Hustle Network book. So check that out. So this podcast will be mainly a continuation of his amazing story and what he has accomplished since, right? So we highly encourage you guys to order the book, read it, read Moni's chapter, and, and then... And then we'll see, this is definitely a part two to his continuation of his amazing story. So Moni, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so um, much. Without taking too much away from the book, give us a, a quick rundown of, of, your, of your amazing life story and then we'll hop into some of the stuff that you're working oh. on right now. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I, uh, I, first of all, like I said, it's an honor to be with you guys, but um, I, looking back, you know, my background was difficult, but yet it's amazing now. Like I, I, I truly believe that um, I was given a gift to go through the hardship and, and to be where I am today. So I, it's tr- such a blessing. But my story began in 1972 when I was born into the killing fields of Cambodia. The first six years of my life, two million Cambodian people were slaughtered, literally slaughtered uh, out of the seven million population at a time. So literally almost a third of my population was slaughtered. I was the, one of the survivors of the killing field. At the, at the the age from when I was born all the way until I was six, I lived in a little shack with four stilts above ground with no running water, no electricity, no toilets, no, um, no, no, no standards, like today's standards at all. So, the, you know, it, we just had to go to bed hungry every night. And as a child, I had to eat every bugs and animal in order to survive. So I came close to death so many times with my sister and I, but we, we made it at the age of six and a half years old. Um, the Vietnamese people actually came into Cambodia to invade Cambodia and fought with, with the, the Communist Party of our country. It gave us an opportunity to run. So my family took off. We walked thousands, hundreds of miles uh, along with um, thousands of other refugees. When bombs going off, dead bodies all over the place, people getting shot and maimed everywhere. Um, I'll never forget at the age of six, you know, crossing the stream in the middle of the night and there was a body stuck to a twig. We'd have to jump over that at the age of six six years old um, in the middle of the night. But those are some of my, uh, my experience at, uh, you know, when, when, when I was younger, made it to Thailand, um, lived there for about four years. Uh, finally, during the four years, I got to go to school for one year and learn the Cambodian language. But um, after four years, we were given permission and a sponsor to come to the United States of America. Before we did that, they sent us to the um, refugee camps in the Philippines, where we live in a little shack with four stilts above ground again, but it was in a tropical forest. So now at the age of nine, um, my father and I made our own wooden gun with umbrella spoke. And we would go to the stream four to six hours each day and shoot for fish, shrimp, and eel and find the firewood to come back home and cook for the family. And then on, the, on other days, I would carry a bag of rice and climb the mountains and trade for potatoes with the, with the Filipinos up in the mountains. It's pretty incredible. And then at the age of 10 and a half, came the United States of America. So, and then um, many things happened, including... Um, growing up in the ghetto of Stockton, uh, my father became a gambling alcoholic. My mother has six months of education. I forged my dad's signatures um, since uh, third grade because he was never around. And I skipped four grades in school, became a child laborer with the, in the fields with the Mexican Hispanic, worked all the way to Oregon as a child, making $20 a day. And at times in the summertime, I would find myself sleeping in the rows of the cucumbers and the strawberries and cherries and boysenberry. 
from being from being so exhausted. And um, anyhow, with all that stuff going on, like so much chaos in my life, growing up with a domestic violence household, at the age of 17, I had to put my father in jail, you know, so and then moved out of the house. But with all that stuff going on, at the, 11 years later, after I arrived in the United States, I became a little more police officer. On December 4th, 1995, the day that changed my life and the, the life of my whole generation. So that's a little bit about me. <laughs> wow, Moni. Um, yeah. I mean, I, you know, for anyone who has read your story in the uplifted book, you know, I think a lot of people who had read your chapter, they had whole, wholeheartedly said that your, your story was just so amazing, you know, and not a lot of people have experienced the things that you have gone through, you know, to be trying to survive any way that you can, trying to kill any animal or bug just to survive, you know, just yeah. to live, you know, not a lot of people can say that they've experienced that. And for you to come out of this, you know, with such, with, with you know, such a clear and bright future ahead of you, um, I, I just wanted to say, you know, it's so amazing to see you to yeah. here today, you know, yeah. and you talking about, you know, the moment that had changed your life, you becoming a police officer. Um, I don't want to give away too much away from the book um, because your story is just so impactful. But I know that there was a moment in your life where you had just told yourself that you wanted to do something with your life, right? And I think you were sitting at a red light somewhere yeah. on, on March Lane on Pacific Avenue. And wow. you said to yourself, <laughs> I know it's crazy that you had given those details too, but I, I think those moments yeah. are what is so clear to us, right? Those moments where it's like, you know what, this is this is a moment where I want to d decide that I want to do something with my life. Tell us about that moment and like what made you decide that, you know, I have such a bright future ahead of me and, you know, you're destined for greatness. Tell us about that moment and what made you come to that conclusion. <laughs> Yeah, this, so there's a combination of things, right? Growing up so poor, like literally had like four pairs of pants to go to school. Mom and dad were never around. Um, I actually made the honor roll. I'm on a dean's list. I, my GPA is like 3.57, even though I barely spoke the language and all that. I've always worked hard, meaning that if I have to get up at two o'clock in the morning, I would get up at two o'clock in the morning. I never missed a homework assignment. I never missed a quiz. I never missed a test, even though I didn't, uh, you know, I didn't know the language that well, but I knew that I had to do this thing. So that was, that was the determination, number one. But number two was that um, at the age of, um, you know, working on the field was one thing. It was so hard making $20 a day and $20, $25 a day. And sometimes when we go back to the camps, my father would teach us how to gamble and we would lose all the money we made for the day. So now moving forward, right, from the age of 11 all the way to 16, I finally got my first job at McDonald's. I even know what a cheeseburger was, you guys. I didn't know what a chicken sandwich was. I didn't know anything other than the hamburgers because that's why my, my father had always bought us hamburgers. We didn't know anything else. It's like allegory of the cave. Like you didn't know anything because you live in a cave and that's all you knew. But six months later, I became employees of the month. I wanted to know everything. I know how to do everything at McDonald's. Like seriously, you guys, I just a student, a learner. I'm like hustling all the time, like <laughs> just trying to be like the best I could be. But one day I was working for um, about 10 hours um, and then I, I called my father to come pick me up and he said, nope, he was too busy gambling. So I had a, the McDonald's uniform at the time was a blue and blue pinstripe and gray, it looked like a jailbird, literally, right? So from my, McDonald's at Sherwood Mall, all the way to my home was like six miles. So I ended up walking home after a long day of shift. And I got home, I got chased by a pit bull in the ghetto of where I live. And I had to go on top of a, a, a van and stay there until the owner called off the pit bull. And then I proceeded my way all the way home. And I remember being so mad. But several months later, after working, I saved up enough money to buy my first car. And I'll never forget, I, I sat in the middle lane, facing north um, at March Lane, on Pacific Avenue at March Lane. And I was at the red light. I was like, oh, my gosh, I was so mad reflecting to that situation. Like, why did my father come pick me up? So, um, you know, mind you, I, I grew up in a domestic violence household. You know, when I got home, my mom and dad, if one day home, they're always fighting, they're always beating each other up. And like I said, at the age of 17, he came after my mom with an ax. I had to jump off a sofa, I like literally tackle him, tackle him down to the ground, choked him out, ripped the cord off the wall, tied him up, held him down until the police showed up. So that was the 
that was the moment in my life where I go, oh my gosh, I never want to be like my father. I said, I'm going to do something about my life. And that's, that's what I decided to do. I, I said, I, I got to do something with my life. I can't have this life. You know, I felt like I had one life to live, but I got to do better than this. I can't do, I can't continue on this tradition of violence and chaos and brokenness. So I want to, I want to make a difference. So that's where I began at the age of 16. Wow. I mean, such perseverance is what I can think of. It's not, not everyone. Oh, can... <laughs> Go ahead. <clears throat> yeah. Not everyone can, can talk with such determination that you did at that point. Right. It's at that point, it's, it's so easy for, for any of us to turn to and just start blaming other people and not taking ownership and not being accountable for one's life or just blaming everything on the circumstances. I think the fact that, I mean, that the voice inside you is so strong that you will be something, that you want to end this cycle, it's, it's amazing, you know? And what, what sort of just gave you that conviction at that moment that you wanted to do something better? What, I mean, as you mentioned, you grew up in, in Stockton and, and like the, non, the not so good areas it's so easy to find family in like a gang or a very bad situation. What propelled you to like seek out a career in law enforcement? You know, um, first of all, the experience that I had, you know, at that time taught me a couple of things. One is one was grit and the other one was no fear. So I had no fear. Like I, I, I you know, literally when I came to the United States of America, I didn't tell you guys this, but the first week, I started dumpster diving every day. I would go to a big apartment complex and, and bring those cans back. And what happened, my brother and sister line them up. This is my first hustling, by the way. And we would take a, 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 a little scoop and would scoop red clay from the backyard and put them into each of the cans. And then I would spray water and then I would crush them and I would bag them so they'd be a lot heavier when I turn them in. So that's, that's my first hustling experience. So, but, but all my experience taught me about no fear um, there's so much grit and that, um, there's gotta be other ways to do this. You know, um, I can't be the first one that will say, oh my God, you know, all these things happen to me and, and uh, let's, let's just give up. But I said, there's gotta be other way. So, uh, that determination, um, set me apart from on most people. But what got me into law enforcement was uh, at the age of 16, I took a class at the high school. It was a civics class on police work. Well, the police work in itself was uh, really, really cool, man. I thought it was so awesome. You cut out the articles, you talk about police work and all the issues and social issues and what police officers do. My first impression at the age of 16, I'm like, wow, kick ass and take names as a police officer. Oh, I got this. I got this. I can do this. You know what I didn't realize? I had to take a writ test to get in. And it took me four long years, four long years, you guys, from the age of 17 all the way age to 21 when I finally passed the test. And I, one of the things I did, talking about grit, right? I never gave up, number one, right? I start taking a test in every city. I start applying everywhere. And what I do is I go take the test and I go, oh my God, I didn't know the source. I didn't know Barnes & Noble existed because remember my role is so like, I mean, bare bone minimum, right? So I start taking a test and my street smart side kicked in. I said, what am I gonna do? So I take a pen and a paper with me to each one of the tests. So I take the test and I was usually, you know, in two hours, everybody else was done. They give us three hours. So I got one hour left. I sat there and studied at every location, every cities I went to. After I'm done, I would turn in my test. I was the last one to turn in. I run outside and start writing down all the vocabularies. I look them up in a dictionary, what it meant, what's investigate, what's difficult, what's complicated, what's intricate, all these words like that associate with police work that I didn't know, but I discovered the, the source at the age of 18. I'm like, oh my God, that's what synonyms all about. Oh my God, that's what antonyms all about. I didn't know you guys. Um, you know, I, it's just like the first time someone says, hey, Moni, go break a leg. I'm like, oh no, you didn't say that. I'm gonna kick your ass because what do you mean break a leg, right? So these type of things that you didn't know, but, but I never gave up that I was willing to find different ways to do it no matter what it took because I wanted something so bad. It took four year, long years and I passed it. I passed it by three points. 
and I got in a, a police academy. I became a police, a reserve, uh, police cadet for the city of Stockton, become a reserve police officer. And then here's, the, here's the, one of the most difficult, difficult things that happened in my life. Right before I graduated, I got into a fight with somebody from the police academy, playing ball, playing basketball, because I was kicking his butt and he knocked me out from behind and a fight was on. And uh, anyhow, so a couple of days later, his house got shot at, my house got broken into. Next thing you know, I got a knock at the door by the police officer that I worked with and he thought I was a drive-by shooting suspect. They took my gun and badge away from me for six and a half months while I was a reserve officer, right before I graduate. I graduated and I had to prove my own innocence. I go, once again, what am I going to do? So I start taking, applying everywhere to be a police officer. Antioch PD, uh, one, of, one of the city was Antioch PD. I went through the testing process and I, uh, and I passed the test, ex uh, and including the lie detector test. So Stockton PD came and looked at the results and said, you know what, Modi has nothing to do with the drive-by shooting. So we give him his badge back. And then that's when I got hired here at Livermore. But never gave up with no fear. That's the lesson. Wow. Thank you, Lonnie, for sharing that. I love the determination and the motivation. I mean, I, I think we, we mentioned this previously about like, as a foreigner learning the English language, it's already so, so difficult. Right. Like if you look at the nuances of like the little things about the English yeah. language, it, some yeah. of the sentences are just like so confusing for a foreigner. Like even for me, it's like, even for me, when I grew up in the United States, like <laughs> it can get very confusing very but for confusing. you to actually, you know, take the extra hour or time after the exam to write down every little single thing that didn't make sense to you or didn't seem familiar to you, you know? And when your memory is the freshest right after the exam, that just goes to show like how much determination that you had. Because most people would just be like, I'm just going to wait for my results and see what happens, you know, but you actually took the, the effort to actually, you know, go out there and scribble everything down so that you could prepare for the next time, um, which is just so amazing. And I know that, you know, a year later, you had graduated from the police academy, right, at the age of 22. Right. And that is such a huge accomplishment. But at the time, you were also, you also had your first son. So, you know, talk about that and what challenges you had at that time. Because, mm -hmm. you know, raising a child is such hard work. And I guess before you get so there, much. before you get there, I do want to comment on the, the framing, I guess, when you first graduated the police academy. How about, uh, man... It just makes me upset to hear that, you know, it's, I feel like it, it happens a lot more often than we think to people of color, you know, and the fact that they were, they were able to prove your innocence and the fact that you stuck with that and remain, remain in high hopes while you didn't have your gun and badge for six months, it shows a lot about your character. So hats off to you, you know, so I'm glad things worked out, but I'm definitely interested to hear more about, you know, now you're, you're you're a young dad. You have your career ahead of you. Yeah, I mean, what was the parenting experience like? And on top of that, we we understand that you're a real estate guru right now. So, like, how do you get into <laughs> real estate? And how do you make that? Oof, yeah, yeah, we, we yeah we we got a long way before we get to the real estate part. But let me let me talk about the uh, the son, my son, and the academy at the same time. So, yeah, at the age of twenty two. Um, uh, I graduated on May 4th, 1995, uh, May, May 20th, 1995. And uh, my son was born in October 18, 1995. So a few months later. But um, those were hard years because I know. And by the way, while I was going to the police academy, I had a full-time job as well. I went to a police academy at nighttime, you know, including the weekends. And then usually it's uh, Tuesday, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, and, and then Saturday and then uh, some uh, all day Saturday and sometimes Sunday. Now working full time job and going to police academy at the same time, uh, it was difficult. You know, when I got out of work, I usually had to iron my clothes, prepare my shoes, shine my shoes, and and make make sure that you know the gig line was amazingly perfect. And by the way, I graduated number two in my class in the um, in uh, physical training. So I did like at the time I was so crazy in shape. 97 push-ups in a minute, 88 sit-ups in a minute. Um, I mean, it was incredible, incredible shape. But I, the best part about it was that, first of all, I didn't know anything about police work. So I had to borrow a police uniform. I had to borrow somebody's police uniform from 
the previous graduating class, but I graduate number 17 academically. Out of 67 of us, 47 of us graduate, 20, um, 20 filled out, 47 of us graduate, it's number 17 academically, and number two in physical training. But being coming a, a young father at age, I didn't know anything. I mean, literally, I didn't know anything. But what helped me, and it is so many full circle of my life because of that, was that while I was going to police academy, I, was, uh, I worked as a bilingual aide in the classroom. So I was translating for parents at teacher conferences. I was writing newsletter in Cambodian to the Cambodian parents. And I was teaching the third, the fourth, and fifth, and sixth grade students uh, the English language. So it helped me at the same time as I'm teaching them. But here's the, here's the beauty, I didn't tell you this either. I went from second grade to third grade to fourth grade. Remember, I signed on paper since third grade. So, so I decided to skip this grade altogether. I signed myself in sixth grade. They let me in. So after six, two months in sixth grade, I met my sixth grade teacher. And after two months, she came to me. She goes, you seem like a mature. I said, yeah, I'm, I am, but I'm a little older. So I told her what happened in the refugee camps in, 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 uh, in Thailand, where my father changed my, lower my age by four years. So because the malnutrition and everything else, I was the same size as all the other kids. So guess what? She talked to the principal. They moved me up to seventh grade after two months in sixth grade. They said, if you do really well in seventh grade, we'll move you up to eighth grade. After four months in seventh grade, I went to eighth grade. I went to ninth grade uh, for two months and then went to ninth grade the next year. But being a young father, I didn't know anything. I didn't know. But I got to tell you, being a bilingual age student or a teacher helped me tremendously because um, remember, my father was never around, so I don't know how to interact with kids. But I saw how students, uh, where teachers interact with the, with the students for three years during the, the three years as, I, as a bilingual, that helped me tremendously how to be a father. And in fact, I read so many more books that I never got to read children's books. In fact, when I became a police officer, one of the first thing I did was I went to one of the local elementary school here, and I would, knock, I would go to the principal's office and ask to read as an officer every day. I would buy books and read to the kids. And that's one of the reasons why I became a children's book author, because I never got to read. I want to be a children's book author. And it took 14 years, $25,000 later, and I became an author. <laughs> so. I love it. I love that you are taking your previous experiences and, you know, because, you know, at, at such a young age, you didn't get to learn the English language. You know, you didn't get to have a lot of experiences, but you took these experiences of or lack of experiences and applied them to your future, which is just so admirable. Um, and like Brian mentioned, you're a real estate guru now. Um, <laughs> tell us about that. I know you, that you had quit your job as a police officer. What made you decide to make that jump? Um, and what was it like for you? Yeah, so I'm a realtor, but I'm, I'm, I'm more a realtor entrepreneur, right? But I um, even though, you know, I, I love my job for 17 years or 18 years in law enforcement, you know, I, I just love my job. And, I, and by the way, when I was an officer, because of my personality, they always put me on the community. So I get to talk to people. I get to take kids to basketball games, football games, Niners game. I mean, I got people, all these things. It's amazing, right? But, but I've always been an entrepreneur all my life, you guys. I mean, I'll give an example. Uh, my mom said at the age of... Um, of three years old in the killing fields of Cambodia, they would pass out the ration. She said, by the time they pass out the ration, I've always stolen enough for the family. In Thailand, in the Philippines, my father would gamble in a, uh, would gamble in a tropical forest. Well, I'm the only one of my five siblings that go find my father. He would give me money and shoo me away. I was able to eat like uh, anything I want because he just wanted to give me money while he has it. And then no one else got to eat except me. I always got to eat. So when I got here in the United States of America, you know, I learned how to ride a girl's bicycle with one pedal, a pink one, and learn how to dumpster dive the week after, right? I mean, if I could tell you stories and stories and always, so I've always been entrepreneurial, you know? So um, after 17 years in law enforcement, I said, you know what? It's time to go on. And, and in fact, the reason why I got into real estate is because, one, I got hurt on a job. I was uh, getting um, off of work as a police officer, midnight shift. And I was turning around to take my rifle to put in my bag. When I turned around to pull the rifle out, I, my back locked up. I couldn't move. Like literally, you guys, such a bad spasm. They had to tramp, pick me up out of the police car, call an ambulance and take me to the hospital. So I ended up in, at home after the hospital, several hours there, and taking medication. And I ended up at home for three days. And then once I got out, I got a few days off. And, I, um, and then at the time, but I never drank coffee before. I start drinking coffee. So I met all these incredible people. One of them happened to be a realtor. She said, Moni, you know, you like houses, right? Yeah. You like people. Yeah. Why don't you become a realtor? 
I said, why not? So I got my license four months later, you guys. Four months later, I got my license. I got off at work in the morning. I signed with Interior office out of San Jose. I would drive to work as a police after getting off of work as a police officer because I want to learn it so bad. I would drive to Sunnyvale for a whole month and miss one class. And I was like, no, I'm determined. I'm going to do this thing, right? So who does that, right? Get off of work at 7 o'clock in the morning as a police officer, then drive to 8 to 5, and they come back home and they go to work at night again. I'm like, no, I'm going to do it. That's the grit. That's the determination most people don't have, right? I'm like, mm, I want something. I'm going to go, I'm gonna go get it. But, uh, but the, being the entrepreneurial is an amazing, like, um, at, you know, so after 17 years in law enforcement, I said, you know what? I'm going to do this thing. But before I did that, though, I decided to do it part-time for a while, five years. So the first, first three years, I, uh, my first transaction by was a short sale at 990 Del Norte in Livermore. I closed that in less than 30 days because I called every, the bank every day. No one has ever closed a, a transaction 30 days before. I've done it. So I began selling. The first year, I sold three homes, three to five, the first three years, and then four to, uh, five to 10 to uh, the fourth and fifth year. On the fifth year, I said, and then the fifth year, I said, no, I planned my exit. So my first year in real estate, I sold 27 homes in a Bay Area. I'm like, oh my God, I made $427,000. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Holy cow. So, and then since that time, so it's been almost 11 years, uh, almost 10 years, March 2nd, 2012, the second worst economic time in American history. I left my police job at making 150,000 a year, five uh, uh, weeks paid vacation, all the benefits and everything else. I just gave it up. I said, you got You want change? You got to be changed right here. Start with you and go get it. Nobody's going to stop you. And here's, what, here's why I did it. One, I want to change the world in three ways. I'm going to tell you how I'm doing it right now. But I said, I said, I told myself, there's no way I'm going to fail. Why? How? I grew up with nothing. I dumpster dive everything. If I, if I fail, the nonprofits will beat me here. If I fail, I still have a condo. I'm like, how can I fail? And I'm willing to wake eight, uh, eight days a week. You go, Moni, Moni, Brian and Maggie goes probably thinking like, Moni, there's only seven days a week. But here's the difference. You're willing to sleep six hours. You're willing to sleep eight hours. I'm willing to sleep four to make up the difference, to make an extra day out of it. And that's the difference between me and most other people. I'm going to do it. <laughs> because why? Everything else is always easier than what I used to have it. Does that make sense? It was so hard before. Oh, my God. The highest uh, paid job I ever had was a bilingual aid at $9.75 an hour. In fact, at one, at one point, by the way, I want to become a police chief. And I said, if I become a police chief, I would have donated 25% of my salary back to my employees. Because I've had so much more than I ever had. <laughs> that makes it easy. <laughs> uh, what, what I can say is, they don't make they don't make them like you anymore, man. <laughs> oh man! And you know what? The best part is about now is like I have a small home. Uh, I have everything that I need. My bucket. I always said my my life bucket. My bucket's full. Like like all the things I'm getting is just overfilling. So now I'm just overfilling to other people, just dropping off, you know, helping other people because I can't because I don't need that much more. Really, mortgage is easy to do. Have a nice home. Really, I have no other desire other than to travel, you guys. So, but helping others and then making a difference and seeing them smile. It's the greatest thing to slice bread. Really. That's, uh, we, that's what do it for me. Yeah. We, we love your, we love your passion and your heart and your desire and your grit. You know, it definitely reflects through your entire life of just defying the odds, you know, just defying your circumstances. You're definitely a great example of true ownership of one's life. And it doesn't matter where you come from, what kind of cards you were dealt initially, right? You were dealing some pretty crappy cards, let's be honest now. Well, yeah. like, you took those cards, you made a straight flush out of that, you know, and now you're on the way to making a royal flush. And yeah. you're continue, <laughs> continue, continuously making a difference in other people's lives and proactively, and it's awesome for us to say this too, like making your way into leadership and government. You know, what spurred that thought of like, hey, I can be mayor. That is that is a pretty big leap, I would say, for it. not just like yourself, but like just for the Asian American community in general, right? That is a pretty big step. What really sprung that, that thought of, hey, like, I want to be mayor. I want to make a difference. I want to be the first Asian American mayor in Livermore. What was that? Where did that come from? Oh, in America. From? 
<laughs> yeah. So it started about six years ago. Um, I joined, uh, um, seven years ago, actually, I joined ARIA, the Asian Real Estate Association of America. And I remember going to my first event conference in, um, in uh, Las Vegas. And I met Tom Chong, who was a 2019 or 2020 president, uh, 2019, I'm sorry. Yeah, last year, uh, two years ago. And, um, you know, it was a, such an amazing experience. And then two years later, I ended up being part of the delegation to go to D.C. to meet with members of Congress. Well, during that year, um, one week before we went, we found out our speaker that we, we went to was APEC, which is Asian Pacific American for, Institute for Congressional Studies, founded by, co-founded by Norman Mineta. And by the way, I got the interview on 35 minutes last year with over 500 people from around the country. It was pretty in- extraordinary. Um, former Secretary of Transportation during the 9-11, by the way. And anyhow, I remember going to that event. Again, Street Smart kicked in. I was way in the back, you guys, 2,000 people, gala, right? But I saw all the VIP, the president of a corporation way up front. I said, I might just go talk to them. So I go talk to them. I talked to the president of Toyota. I talked to all these VIPs. I don't know who they are. They don't know who I am. I'm just saying hello to all these people. No fear, right? So right before, um, right before that, uh, uh, you know, as I was talking to them, uh, uh, one of the people that work in their volunteers came to me and goes, hey, we're about to introduce the speaker. By the way, it was President Obama. So I was right next to the line with all the Secret Service. So he said, whatever you do, don't leave. So he got introduced. Then he spoke for about 20 minutes. And then next thing you know, he came at me. I was like the fifth person he shook hand with. I'm like, oh, my God, I got to meet President Obama, right? By the way, he got the nice, softest man hand I ever met. Okay, never touch. <laughs> but I got to meet President Obama. And then so um, I, I continue to be with the Asian Real Estate Association of America. So, um, until two years ago, the mayor of my city walked up to me in an event because I'm pretty well known here in the community. And so he said, Moni, can you be my campaign manager? I'm like, what? Me, campaign manager, right? I don't know anything about politics, right? right? But I thought of Richard Branson's statement. He said, you know, he said, when someone gives you an opportunity, figure out, figure how to do that shit later. Say yes and figure out how to do that shit later, right? Basically. So I said, oh my God, let's do it. I said, yes, I would do it. So I Googled the, the infrastructure. Within a week, I gathered 23 people to be on a committee. We won by 83%, you guys. It's crazy, right? I'm like, oh, shoot. Hey, if I could help him, why can't, why can't I help myself? Why can't I be the mayor? I said, first of all, there's no Cambodian American mayor in the history of America ever. Like, I could be the first one. But more importantly, I would represent the, the, the unheard voices, like his, Hispanic, the Asian, right? The minorities, right? The um, people really I haven't heard from, but I would be so inclusive because I, I grew up poor, right? So I understand what poor people go through. I, I, I've done well, so I understand what people have done well go through, right? So the people have always done well, they don't know what that is. You know, I would speak to the people in the ESL classes. I would speak to the moms and pop store. I would, I would stop by people's homes and just say hello to them. That's what I would do as a mayor. But I said, why not me? So I decided to do it during COVID of all times, right? So I raised 45000 by myself and got 35% of the vote, 15,560 votes out of Livermore. Not bad for someone who's never done it, but I learned so much. And I, now I go, wow, there might be another opportunity come up, you guys. And I could be the first Cambodian American mayor in the history of America. And we would transform this community because um, our people, API a community, they can't relate to someone like us unless we see someone like us in the power position, in the leadership position. And we need more representation than ever. So if those of you are out there, I so wholeheartedly encourage you to get involved. I'm going to try different ways. I'm not sure, but I sure learn a lot. I sure learn how to run a campaign. I would do so many things differently. Now I learn how to establish a coalition. I learn how to establish more deeper relationships. But I met so many incredible people along the way, you guys, and incredible friends as a result. And that's the best thing about it. So if you're thinking about it, out there, go do it. I I highly suggest it. That is such an amazing feat, Moni. And I wholeheartedly agree with you. I think that, you know, if we don't see Asians on screen or in office, like it's really hard for the younger generation of the Asian community to look up, you know, and see the, watch the news and see what's going on in media and see what's going on in politics and think like, oh, can I be that person to make change, right? We have to actually see people who look like us and sound like us to actually 
believe that in the first place. Like I see that person, like she looks like my mom or he looks like my dad. Like I can do the same thing. Right. Mm -hmm. And I love that you are such a big advocate for that. And you're, you're also such a big advocate for underserved voices. You know, you're doing so much to go out to the community and seeing what is the best thing for the community. Um, I guess in like your own words, what does advocacy look like to you, you know, and how can like we as like just like normal citizens ensure there is more representation for Asians in office? Like what can we do, you know, to make sure that there's more representation? Um, and, and what does advocacy look like to you? Advocacy is basically for me, it's just speaking for the underserved community, meaning, for example, I get you involved. Like if I if I know that you're, um, you know, if I'm, I'm in leadership position and I know that I have a certain thing that I know that you are interested in this area, but the only way to be, to learn about you, Maggie and Brian, for example, is uh, for me to spend time with you. But once I know you as a person, I know your interests, then when I go to events that are interesting to you, I would bring you along. So what, for example, when I do client appreciation with, for my clients, I would have 60, 80 to 100 people at a time. And when I bring them in, I go, oh, you like older cars. You like older cars. Hey, you connect. You connect, you connect on different interests. Does that make sense? So when you do that, and then by the way, in the power networking, it's not about what you can get out of it. Me, when I meet with you, you will always know that who's going to be the first one like, Maggie, what can I do for you? What can I do for our community? Not like, what can you do for me first, Maggie? But hey, can we bring all the authors to my home so I could open my home, I could host it. We could bring all of us together so we know the stories behind the story, you see, the person, the, 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 the people behind the book. So this way, once we know each other more, what do we want to host something together and we could, we could inspire other people together? But because single-handedly, you can make a difference. But when you get 18 inspired people together, the synergy is amazing. That's how the Tri-Valley Nonprofit Alliance, which I co-founded, now serves over 400 nonprofit organizations today because of the synergy, because of the ideas behind the ideas of people wanting to get together goes, you know what, I want to make a difference because that's what nonprofits are all about. It's nonprofits will fill in the gaps where government do not. And that's where nonprofit comes in. And imagine getting all of us together like that. And that's one of the reasons why I love what you guys do is you expand your network. You host events in Australia and different places and just trying to bring us together. But we got to go even bigger, for example. What if we... Uh, for example, in May, for example, what if we were to host Norma Mineta and celebrate a API and interview him, uh, have people read his, watch his life story on, K, uh, on, C, on, uh, on one of the doc documentaries of his life story. And then people are going to get inspired, you know, just so you know, like the 1990 uh, American Disability Act. He's the one that brought it together. Did you guys know that? He's the one, he's the author. And the reason why it's been when he became the mayor of San, of, of, uh, San Jose, he promised a family that had polio, the child has the polio, that he's going to operate out of, of a wheelchair for a whole week. And he realized the sidewalk was too small. There's no lips to go into the sidewalks. Does that make sense? That's why you see the, uh, the American Disability Act came, and that's why you see the, the wheelchair ramps and all that. That's because he wanted to make a difference. But how would you know if you're never willing to do those things and live the life, put yourself in the shoes of others? And that's what, that's what happened when you, you know, you grew up poor. You know, I could talk about other people I get emotional about because it hits home. It was me. You know, I could see a child in a, in a third world country, for example. It reminded me of me. Um, I was, you know, I just saw the news the other day in Afghanistan, you know, because um, half of the population right now is going through famine. Why? Because there's no money. They, you know, if the West release all the money, they don't know where the money's going to go. So they have to support the NGOs. The NGOs can't get in there fast enough to feed the people. So half the, half the kids are like down the skin of bone. Remind me of me. And you can only have those, those type of sympathy or empathy for people is um, because you've gone through it yourself. And then those who have it, we've got to be able to do more for other people. My bucket is full of Maggie and Brian. I don't really need anything else. I just want to do more to help whoever I can, especially our community. That's, what, that's why I, you know, I share with you a couple of ideas that I, I'm going to be working on. I hope that uh, to launch it pretty soon. Thank you so much for sharing that, Moni. You're, you're doing so much for the community. And, you know, I agree. You know, there, there's just so much that we can give back to the community and serve the community that, you know, it, it doesn't, 
we always say like the same thing for Asian Hustle Network. Like we just want to give back to the community because we see that there is so much opportunity for us to give, you know, and there's so many people who are, who are seeking for help, who need help more than we do. Um, so I just really appreciate everything that you've done. Um, you know, and ultimately, you know, while you did place second in the mural election, um, you know, you, you just brought out so many great ideas and you were so bold during this whole campaign. Can you talk about what your next goals are and what you have coming up forward? Um, I'm sure this, this has taught you such a valuable lesson. I want to know like internally what that, what this has taught you, what this experience has, has taught you and what kind of lesson you took out of it and what you kind of see going forward for you um, in the next couple of years. Yeah, I, I just have, um, um, it's funny, uh, I, I don't know where this come from, but I have a vision of being a mayor. And I pretended like I was a mayor two years ago. And uh, I don't want to say pretend, but I act like I was a mayor because people come up to me, call me the mayor, and I could answer people's questions. I could point people to the right direction, to the right person, to the right location, to the right organization. Those are the things that I do as a mayor. So I've already been doing it. And I've been doing it for all my life since I've been part of this community for 27 years now in Livermore. So, um, I truly believe that would make an amazing mayor. I truly believe that I could do a great job because I have understanding not only people, but I also understanding what the community needs are. So, um, and then the only way to do that is to learn about people, to sit down with people, have coffee with people, whole, host town hall meetings, you know, um, have private conversation, call them. You know, that's what I do really, really well. You know, I, I call people all the time. But there's, there's so many um, amazing opportunities for, for us on the, on the, in the real world. You know, think of one or two or three ways to contribute. You don't have to go all out. Like, for example, uh, a couple of things I want to do. I may run for mayor again in this next around here. It just depends. You know, I've been praying about it. I don't know where that's all going to go. But I just hope that God has a plan for me, allow me to do what I need to do to serve the people. In fact, I'm, I was, when I ran, I was going to donate my salary. And I will continue to donate my salary as a mayor. That's another thing that we need to bring up. As mayor, we're going to make that an issue, by the way. Because right now, for example, the city of Livermore, because it's a small city, the mayors make $18,000 a year. So with that, you can't make a living. If you make it a living wage, say eighty to 100000 plus some benefits, and then other people of your age, younger or a little older, whatever, could come out and say, you know what? I want to serve my community. I want to serve, but I want to be able to have a living wage too. Right now? Only the rich, old, and white you, oftentimes will be able to do it because they have the pension. They have the family transfer wealth. We're first generation here. Most of us, Asian American uh, immigrants, we're first generation. We don't have anything transferred. The only thing we transfer is probably debt when your parents die. We don't have that. But I will have the ability now to transfer to my grandchildren to make sure that they're educated, right? We don't have that, but we need to change that. So I may run for mayor again. Second thing I would like to do is um, I'd like to launch a couple um, organizations. One is called East Bay Home Ownership Opportunity. And I'm changing that nonprofit right now. I'm hoping to get it pretty soon. And um, once I get that, I would like, like to launch a 20 for $20, uh, $20 for 20 homeowners. What I mean is that I might ask each and every one of you out there, including you and Maggie and Brian, I would love for you to contribute 20 and minimum $20 per month. And it's $240 a year. So if I get 1,000 donors, that's 200 plus thousand. But if a 200 plus thousand, I give away 50,000 per quarter, right? Five people, $10,000 each to help them on a journey of buying home. The only criteria, the two criteria, one, you have to use the fund within six months of receiving it. Two is that you make a less than 150,000 a year. And if you're Asian American, police officer, firefighter, you know, nurses, uh, first time home buyer, single parents household, you get two entry into the drawing. So this way we don't discriminate because what does home ownership do for us? Three things, stability, right? Um, security, right? And then more importantly, build wealth that you could pass on because of, we, we all know we're in real estate, right? Everything in America, 68% of the people own a home, if not more. And the higher level leadership you go to, over 90% own a home. And they, we all own a home because why? Because of stability, security, and creating wealth for our family. That's what it's all about. And I, wait, I can't wait to do that. And the other uh, thing that I wanna do is I'm launching with a group of 10 people. It's called East Bay Entrepreneur Circle. My idea is to bring people together and all these business leaders to help immigrants, women, um, and it's just to help the moms and pop store how to grow their business and scale their business, but understanding the concept of business so they could scale their business. 
but it would be an honor to help uh, you know immigrants like you know myself that first come here. And how do you get funds? Where do you get grants? How do you get the permits? Oh, you can't get permits? I'll go with you to the city hall to get the permits with you. I've done that. But if we have the right people in place to help all those people, we could make more because entrepreneur is an ingenuity allow you to be so creative, so creative, as you know. Look what you guys, morphing and pivoting all the time into different things. It's exciting. I love it. <laughs> Thank you, Moni. Yeah. We're so excited for all of your upcoming plans. Um, and for all of our listeners, you know, this, this will be our last question. And I think, you know, our listeners can find this very helpful. But if you had one advice for an aspiring entrepreneur, what would that one advice be? Actually, I have a few, actually. I wrote down a few. So one is uh, um, if for entrepreneur, go after your dreams strategically. Here's five advice I would give you. One, research your field. Know the ins and outs. Know, do your homework on, on what you want to do. Know the ins and outs of it. Two is um, study subject matter, you know, uh, expert. You know, find those people. You know, talk to those people before you decide to do something. Seek a mentor or a coach is another advice I would give you because I've learned so much for to have great people around me, allow me to excel faster than just trying to figure it out by myself. It's not, a, it's not about a shotgun approach. Number four, be a student at all times. Learn as much as I can. I learn how to moderate. I learn how to, um, I've graduated from five leadership academies the last uh, 10 years and became a children's book author and founded a nonprofit organization. I have many more things I want to do. And what, I, what happened is, because I was a student, I have no fear. I could do anything. My mind says, Moni, whatever you want to do, you could do. So I don't let other people project their limiting beliefs on me because I know me, but, but because I know me because I'm a student, that I can do anything I want. And then uh, the other thing is doing things out of your comfort zone. God, do things out of your comfort zone. And for those of us, uh, well, let me give some example. Being a mayor's candidate, being a mayor's uh, campaign manager. Um, I did the Dancing with the Stars uh, here locally where I performed in front of 500 plus people after five hours of training with a professional trainer. That's crazy, right? But I did it, right? But um, one of the things that for us as Asian American who comes here as, uh, as immigrants, one of the first thing we gotta do is command the English language. Command the English language. I'm writing a couple more books, by the way. It's called Welcome to America. Business and life lesson to be successful. One of them is command the English language. Because what happened is, if Americans or other people who are you're presenting in front, they, because you don't have the command of the English language, within 30 seconds, you lose their attention. Therefore, they never got to know that you got a bachelor degree, or you got a PhD. They didn't see how wise, how smart, how much wisdom you have to bring to the table for you. So command this English language. So this way, we could articulate our points and get those points across so we could become influential. So we could help others and others could help you and then you could help more people because you, you, you've done well and you made so much more. Huge. So I hope uh, those are some good advice that you could take uh, with you and our audience they can take with them and that uh, they too can do it too. And I just have um, this amazing feeling that I could do anything because I'm a student at all times. Amazing. Yes, that's I love that mindset. And thank you so much for sharing those amazing advice. So where can our listeners find out more about you online, Moni? Oh, my gosh, uh, Moni Not Real Estate or Moni Not, not dot com. But uh, just look me up. Uh, there's uh, there's so many um, articles and whatnot written about me and whatnot. I, I love it. But uh, I just love hearing from people. But more importantly, I just love to hear what you have to do to make a difference in the lives of others. And my goal is that I don't want to be known as a, a realtor. I want to be known as a philanthropist first and then a realtor second and maybe a businessman or a police officer last. <laughs> but I want to be known as a, someone who gives back to the, to the world. And that's what I plan on doing uh, all my life for the rest of my life. Amazing. Thank you so much, Moni. Uh, we are at the top of the hour. Just wanted to thank you so much for being on our show today. We had such an amazing time learning about your story. <laughs> and for anyone who wants to learn more about Moni's story, go check out the Uplifted book. It's called Uplifted Journeys of Abundance, Community, and Identity. And Moni's story is featured on there. Thank you, guys. Really appreciate Maggie and Brian. And please buy the book. And it's going to only help our community. Uh, well, I know Brian and Maggie have their hearts in the right place that so they're going to do some amazing things with it. And if I can help it, I will help in any way that I can. I'm still want to host and I still want to be part of you guys. Let me know how I get help. Okay. Thank you so much, you guys. Awesome. Thank you so much, Moni. Appreciate you. Okay. All right. Bye-bye guys. Thank you.